Aye. Be continuing on page one fifty two. The crisis of meaning. All right, so we're trying to get to 167. That art works in a Accord with Kant's magnificently paradoxical formula are purposeless, that they are separated from empirical reality and serve no aim that is useful for self-preservation in life, precludes calling art's meaning its purpose, despite meaning's affinity to imminent teleology. Yet it becomes ever harder for artworks to cohere as a nexus of meaning. Ultimately, they respond to this by rejecting the very concept of meaning. The more the emancipation of the subject demolished every idea of a pre-established order conferring meaning, the more dubious the concept of meaning became as the refuge of a fading theology. Even prior to Auschwitz, it was an affirmative lie given historical experience to ascribe any positive meaning to existence. This has consequences that reach deep into aesthetic form. When artworks have nothing external to themselves to which they can cling without ideology, what they have lost cannot be restored by any subjective act. It was wiped out by their tendency toward subjectivization, which was no cultural historical accident, but conforms rather with the true state of things. Critical self-reflection, inherent in every artwork, sharpens the work's sensitivity not only toward every element that strengthens traditional meaning, but also against the work's imminent meaning and those of the, its categories that provide meaning. For the meaning that is the synthesis of the artwork cannot merely be something that it has manufactured, its quintessence. At the same time, the totality of the work presents meaning and produces it aesthetically. It reproduces it. Meaning is only legitimate in the artwork insofar as it is objectively more than the work's own meaning. 
In that artworks relentlessly chip away at the nexus in which meaning is founded, they turn against this nexus and against meaning altogether. The unconscious labor of the artistic ingenium on the meaning of the work as on something substantial and enduring transcends this meaning. The advanced production of recent decades has become self-conscious of this issue, has made it thematic and translated into the structure of artworks. It is easy to convict neo-Dadaism of a lack of political import and dismiss it as meaningless and purposeless in every sense of the word. Big Daddy. But to do so is to forget that its products ruthlessly demonstrate the fate of meaning without any regard to themselves as artworks. Beckett's oeuvre already presupposes this experience of the destruction of meaning as self-evident, yet also pushes it beyond meaning's abstract negation in that his plays force the traditional categories of art to undergo this experience, concretely suspend them, and extrapolate others out of the nothingness. The dialectical reversal that occurs is obviously not a derivative of theology. Do you want to go outside? is obviously not a derivative of theology, which always heaves a sigh of relief whenever its concerns are treated in any way, no matter what the verdict, as if at the end of the tunnel of metaphysical meaninglessness, the presentation of the world as hell, a light glimmers. Gunther Anders was right to defend Beckett against those who make his works out to be affirmative. Beckett's plays are absurd not because of the absence of any meaning, then they would be simply irrelevant, but because they put meaning on trial, they unfold as history. His work is ruled as much by an obsession with positive nothingness as by the obsession with a meaninglessness that has developed historically and is thus, in a sense, merited, though this meritedness in no way allows any positive meaning to be reclaimed. Nevertheless, the emancipation of artworks from their meaning becomes aesthetically meaningful once this emancipation is realized in the aesthetic material precisely because the aesthetic meaning is not immediately one with theological meaning. Artworks that divest themselves of any semblance of meaning do not thereby forfeit their similitude to language. They enunciate their meaninglessness with the same determinacy as traditional artworks enunciate their positive meaning. Today, this is the capacity of art. Through the consistent negation of meaning, it does justice to the postulates that once constituted the meaning of art works. Works at the highest level of form that are meaningless or alien to meaning are therefore more than simply meaningless because they gain their content through the negation of meaning. Artwork that rigorously negates meaning is, by this very rigor, bound to the same density and unity that was once requ requisite to the presence of meaning. Artworks become nexuses of meaning, even against their will, to the extent that they negate meaning. Although the crisis of meaning is rooted in a problematic common to all art, the failure in the face of rationality, reflection is unable to repress the question whether art does not perhaps, through the demolition of meaning, throw itself into the arms of precisely that which strikes ordinary consciousness as absurd, the positivistically reified consciousness. The dividing line between authentic art that takes on itself the crisis of meaning and a resigned art consisting literally and figuratively of protocol sentences is that in significant works, the negation of meaning itself takes shape as a negative. 
whereas in the others, the negation of meaning is stubbornly and positively replicated. Everything depends on this, whether meaning inheres in the negation of meaning in the artwork or if the negation conforms to the status quo, whether the crisis of meaning is reflected in the works or whether it remains immediate and therefore alien to the subject. Key events may include certain musical works such as Cage's Piano Concerto, which impose on themselves a law of inexorable aleatoriness and thereby achieve a sort of meaning, the expression of horror. What governs Beckett's work certainly is a parodic unity of time, place, and action combined with artfully fitted and balanced episodes in a catastrophe that consists solely in the fact that it never takes place. Truly, one of the enigmas of art and evidence of the force of its logicality is that all radical consistency, even that called absurd, culminates in similitude to meaning. This, however, is not confirmation of metaphysical substantiality, to which every thoroughly formed work would lay claim as confirmation of its illusoriness. Ultimately, art is semblance in that, in the midst of meaninglessness, it is unable to escape the suggestion of meaning. Artworks, however, that negate meaning must also necessarily be disrupted in their unity. This is the function of montage, which disavows unity through the emerging disparateness of the parts at the same time that, as a principle of form, it reaffirms unity. The relation between the technique of montage and photography is familiar. Montage has its appropriate place in film. The sudden discontinuous juxtaposition of sequences, editing employed as an artistic means, wants to serve intentions without damaging the intentionlessness of life as it is, which is the actual interest of film. On no account is the principle of montage a trick to integrate photography and its derivatives into art, despite the limitations defined by their dependence on the empirical reality. Rather, montage goes beyond photography imminently without infiltrating it with a facile sorcery, but also without sanctioning it as a norm its status as a thing. It is photography's self-correction. Montage originated in antithesis to mood-laden art, primarily impressionism. Impressionism dissolved objects, drawn primarily from the sphere of technical civilization or its amalgams with nature, into their smallest elements in order to synthesize them gaplessly into the dynamic continuum. It wanted aesthetically to redeem the alienated and heterogeneous in the replica. The conception proves ever less adequate the more intense, it, intense the superiority of the reified prosaic worlds over the living subject became. The subjectivization of objective reality relapsed into romanticism as was soon blatantly obvious not only in Jugendstil, but also in the later stages of authentic Impressionism. It was against this that the montage, that montage protested, which developed out of the pasted-in newspaper clippings and the like during the heroic years of Cubism. The semblance provided by Arch, that through the fashioning of the heterogeneously empirical, it was reconciled with it, was to be broken by the work admitting into itself literal illusionless ruins of empirical reality, thereby acknowledging the fissure and transforming it for purposes of aesthetic effect. Arch wants to admit its powerlessness vis-a-vis -vis late capitalist totality and to initiate its abrogation. Montage is the inner aesthetic capitulation of art to what stands heterogeneously opposed to it. The negation of synthesis becomes a principle of form. In this, montage unconsciously takes its lead from a nominalistic utopia, one in which the pure facts are mediated by neither form nor concept and irremediably divest themselves of their facticity. The facts themselves are to be demonstrated in didactical di fashion, as epistemology calls it. The artwork wants to make the facts eloquent by letting them speak for themselves. Art thereby begins the process of destroying the artwork as a nexus of meaning. For the first time in the development of art, a fixed debris cleaves visible scars in the work's meaning. This brings montage into a much broader context. All modern art after Impressionism 
probably including even the radical manifestations of expressionism, has abjured the semblance of a continuum grounded in the unity of subjective experience, in the stream of lived experience. The intertwinement, the organic commingling, is severed. The faith destroyed that one thing merges wholly with the other, unless the entwinement becomes so dense and intricate as to obscure meaning completely. This is complemented by the aesthetic principle of construction, the blunt primacy of a planned whole over the details and their interconnection in the microstructure. In terms of this microstructure, all modern art may be called montage. Whatever is unintegrated is compressed by the subordinating authority of the whole as that, so that the totality compels the failing coherence of the parts and thus, however, once again asserts the semblance of meaning. This dictated unity corrects itself in accord with the tendencies of the details in modern art. The instinctual life of sounds or colors in, in music, for example, in accord with the harmonic and melodic demand that complete use be made of the available tones of the chromatic scale. Certainly, this tendency in turn derives from the totality of the material from the available spectrum and is defined by the system rather than actually being spontaneous. The idea of montage and that of technological construction, which is inseparable from it, becomes irreconcilable with the idea of the radical, fully formed artwork with which it was once recognized as being identical. The principle of montage was conceived as an act against a surreptitiously achieved organic unity. It was meant to shock. Once this shock is neutralized, the assemblage once more becomes a becomes merely indifferent material. The technique no longer suffices to trigger communication between the aesthetic and the extra aesthetic, and its interest dwindles to a cultural historical curiosity. If, however, as in the commercial film, the intentions of montage are insisted upon, they are jarringly heavy-handed. Criticism of the principle of montage has implications for constructivism, in which montage has camouflaged itself, precisely because constructivist form succeeds only at the cost of the individual impulse, ultimately the mimetic element. As a result, constructivism is always in danger of rattling emptily, sacrificate itself, as it is represented by constructivism within the bounds of non-functional art, is subject to the critique of semblance. What claims to be strictly adequate to its purpose fails because the work's formative process interferes with the impulses of what is to be formed. An imminent purposefulness is claimed that in fact none at all, and that the work that is in fact none at all, and that the work lets the teleology of the particular elements atrophy. Cyclicite turns out to be ideology, the jostless unity to which sacrikite or the technical artwork pretends is never achieved. In those, admittedly minimal, hollows that exist between all particular elements in constructivist works, what has been standardized and bound together breaks apart in just the same way as do suppressed individual interests under total administration. After the default of any higher subordinating jurisdiction, the process between the whole and the particular has been turned back to a lower court, to the impulse of the details themselves, in accord with the nominalistic situation. At this point, art is conceivable only on the condition that any pre-given subordinating standard be excluded. The blemishes that indelibly mark purely expressive organic works offer an analogy to the anti-organic praxis of montage. This brings an antinomy into focus. Artworks that are commensurable to aesthetic experience are meaningful insofar as they fulfill an aesthetic imperative, the requirement that everything be required. This ideal, however, is directly opposed to the development that it itself set in motion. Absolute determination, which stipulates that everything is important to an equal degree and that nothing may remain external to the inner nexus of the work, converges, as Gergi Ligeti perceives, with absolute arbitrariness. This gnaws away retrospectively at aesthetic lawfulness. It always has an element of positiveness, of game rules and contingency, 
since the beginning of the modern age, most notably in 17th century Dutch paintings and the early English novel, art has absorbed contingent elements of landscape and fate that were not as such construable out of any overarching ordo or idea of life in order to be able to grant them meaning freely within the aesthetic continuum. Ultimately, however, the impossibility of any subjectively established objectivity of meaning, which was hidden over the long epochs of the rise of the bourgeoisie, abandoned the nexus of meaning itself to that very contingency whose mastery once defined form. The development toward the negation of meaning is what meaning deserved. However, though this development is inevitable and has its own truth, it is accompanied by a hostility to art that is, although not to the same extent, narrow-mindedly mechanistic and, in terms of its propensity, reprivatizing. This development is allied with the eradication of aesthetic subjectivity by virtue of its own logic. Subjectivity is made to pay the price for the production of the untruth of aesthetic semblance. Even so-called absurd literature participates in this dialectic in the work of its most important representatives, in that as a nexus of meaning organized teleologically in itself, it expresses the absence of meaning and thus through determinate negation maintains the category of meaning. This is what makes its interpretation possible, indeed demands it. Categories such as unity, or even harmony, harmony, have not tracelessly vanished as a result of the critique of meaning. The determinate antithesis of individual artworks toward empirical reality furthers the coherence of those artworks. Otherwise, the gaps in the work structure would be invaded, as occurs in montage, by the unwieldy material against which it protects itself. This is what is true in the traditional concept of harmony. What survives of this concept after the negation of the culinary has retracted to the category of the whole, even though the whole no longer takes precedence over the details. Although art revolts against its neutralization as an object of contemplation, insisting on the most extreme incoherence and dissonance, these elements are those of unity. Without this unity, they would not even be dissonant. Even when art unreservedly obeys the dictates of inspiration, the principle of harmony metamorphosed to the point of unrecognizability is at work because inspiration, if it is to count, must gel. That tacitly presupposes an element of organization and coherence, at least as a vanishing point. Aesthetic experience, no less in fact than theoretical experience, is constantly made aware that inspirations and ideas that do not gel impotently dissipate. Art's paratactical logicality consists in the equilibrium of what it coordinates, a homeostasis in which the concept of aesthetic harmony is sublimated as a last resort. With regard to its elements, such aesthetic harmony is negative and stands in a dissonant relation to them. They undergo something similar to what individual tones once underwent in the pure consonants of a triad. Thus, aesthetic harmony qualifies in its own right as an element. The mistake of traditional aesthetics is that it exalts the relationship of the whole to the parts to one of entire wholeness, to totality, and hoists it in triumph of the heterogeneous as a banner of illusory positivity. The ideology of culture in which unity, meaning, and positivity are synonyms inevitably boils down to a laudatio temporis acti, as the sermon goes, society once enjoyed a blessed closure when every artwork had its place, function, and legitimation and therefore enjoyed its own closure. Whereas today everything is constructed in emptiness and artworks are internally condemned to failure. However transparent the tenor of such ideas, which invariably maintain an all too secure distance from art and falsely imagine that they are superior to inner aesthetic necessities, it is better to follow up what is insightful in them rather than to brush them aside on the basis of the role they play, since failure to investigate them might contribute to their preservation. 
On no account does an artwork require an a priori order in which it is received, protected, and accepted. If today nothing is harmonious, this is because harmony was false from the beginning. The closure of the aesthetic, ultimately of the extra aesthetic, system of reference does not necessarily correspond to the dignity of the artwork. The dubiousness of the ideal of a closed society applies equally to that of the closed artwork. It is incontestable that artworks have, as diehard reactionaries never cease to repeat, lost their social embeddedness. The transition from this security into the open has become for them a horror vacui that they adjust an anonymous and ultimately non-existent audience has not been just a blessing, not even imminently. Not for their authenticity and not for their relevance. What ranks as problematic in the aesthetic sphere has its origins here. The remainder became the plunder of boredom. Every new artwork, if it is to be one, is exposed to the danger of complete failure. If in his own time, Hermann Grab praised the pre-formation of style in the keyboard music of the 17th and early 18th centuries because it precluded anything obviously bad, it could be rejoined that this style just as certainly excluded the possibility of what is emphatically good. Bach was so incomparably superior to the music that preceded him and that of his epoch because he broke through this pre-formation. Even the Lukash of the theory of the novel had to admit that the artworks that came after the end of the supposedly meaning-filled age had gained infinitely in richness and depth. What speaks for the survival of the concept of harmony as an element is that artworks that remonstrate against the mathematical ideal of harmony and the requirement of symmetrical relations, striving rather for absolute asymmetry, fail to slough off all symmetry. In terms of its artistic value, Asymmetry is only to be comprehended in its relation to symmetry. This has recently been confirmed by what Kahnweiler has called the phenomenon of distortion in Picasso. Similarly, new music has shown reverence for the tonality that it abolished through the extreme sensitivity that it developed toward its rudiments. This is documented by Schoenberg's ironic comment from the early years of atonality that the Mondflack a Pierrot Lunaire was composed according to the strict rules of counterpoint, which only permitted prepared consonants and then only on unaccented beats. The further real domination of nature progresses, the more painful it becomes for art to admit the necessity of that progress within itself. In the ideal of harmony, art senses acquiescence to the administered world, even though art's opposition to this world continues with steadily increasing autonomy, the domination of nature. Art concerns itself as much as it is contrary to itself. Just how much these innervations of art are bound up with its position in reality could be viscerally sensed in the bombed German cities of the post-war years. In the face of actual chaos, the optical order that the aesthetic sensorium has long, had long ago rejected once again became intensely alluring. However, rapidly advancing nature, the vegetation in the ruins, brought all vacation-minded romanticization of nature to a deserving, to a deserved end. For a brief historical moment, what traditional aesthetics called satisfying, harmonic and symmetrical relations returned. When traditional aesthetics, Hegel's included, praised harmony and natural beauty, it projected the self-satisfaction of domination onto the dominated. What is qualitatively new in recent art may be that in an allergic reaction, it wants to eliminate harmonizations even in their negated form. Truly the negation of negation with its own fatality, the self-satisfied transition to a new positivity, to the absence of tension in so many paintings and compositions of the post-war decades. False positivity is the technological locus of the loss of meaning. What during the heroic years of modern art was perceived as its meaning maintained the ordering elements of traditional art as determinately negated. The liquidation results in a smoothly functioning but empty identity. Even artworks freed from harmonistic symmetrical ideas are formally characterized by similarity and contrast 
static and dynamic, exposition, transition, development, identity, and return. Works are unable to wipe out the difference between the first appearance of an element and its repetition, no matter how modified that may be. The capacity to sense and employ harmonic and symmetrical relations in their most abstract form has become progressively more subtle. Whereas in music, a more or less tangible reprise was once required to establish symmetry, now a vague similarity of tone color at various points may suffice. Dynamic freed from every static reference and no longer discernible as such by its contrast to something fixed, is transformed into something that hovers and no longer has direction. In the manner of its appearance, Stockhausen's Zeitmasche evokes a through composed cadence, a fully presented yet static dominant. Yet today, such invariants become what they are only in the context of change. Whoever tries to distill them from the dynamic complexion of history or from the individual work thereby misrepre misrepresents them. Because the concept of spiritual order is itself worthless, it cannot be transposed from cultural cogitations to art. Opposites are intermixed in the ideal of the closure of the artwork, the irrevocable compulsion toward coherence, the ever-fragile utopia of reconciliation in the image, and the longing of the objectively weakened subject for a heteronymous order, a constant of German ideology. Temporarily deprived of any direct satisfaction, authoritarian instincts revel in the imago of an absolutely closed culture where meaning is guaranteed. Closure for its own sake, independent of truth content and what this closure is predicated on, is a category that in fact deserves the ominous charge of formalism. Certainly this does not mean that positive and affirmative artworks, virtually the whole story of traditional art, are to be dismissed or defended on the basis of the all too abstract argument that, given their abrupt opposition to empirical life, they too are critical and negative. <clears throat> the philosophical critique of unreflective nominalism prohibits any claim that the trajectory of progressive negativity, the negation of objectively binding meaning, is that of unqualified progress in art. However much a song by Webern is more thoroughly constructed, the universality of the language of Schubert's Winterreis secures for it an element of superiority. Though it is nominalism that helps art achieve its language in the first place, still there is no language without the medium of a universality beyond pure particularization, however requisite the latter. This overarching universality necessarily bears a degree of affirmation. This can be sensed in the world understanding. Affirmation and authenticity are amalgamated to no small degree. Yet this is no argument against any individual work. At most, it is an argument against the language of art as such. There is no art that is entirely devoid of affirmation, since by its very existence, every work rises above the plight and degradation of daily existence. The more binding art is to itself, the richer, denser, and more unified its works, the more it tends towards affirmation of whatever stamp by suggesting that its own qualities are those of a world existing in itself beyond art. This a priori of the affirmative is art's ideological dark side. It projects the reflection of possibility onto the existing even as the latter's determinate negation. This element of affirmation withdraws from the immediacy of artworks and what they say and become, and becomes the fact that they continue to speak at all. That the world spirit never made good on its promise has the effect of lending the affirmative works of the past a touching quality rather than ensuring that they remain truly ideological. Today, indeed, what appears evil in consummate works is their own commensurate cons consummateness as a monument of, to force rather than a transfiguration that is too transparent to spur any opposition. According to cliché, great works are compelling. In being so, they cultivate coercion to the same extent that they neutralize it. Their guilt is their guiltlessness. Modern art, with its vulnerability, blemishes, and fallibility, 
is the critique of traditional works, which in so many ways are stronger and more successful, is the critique of success, is predicated on the recognition of the inadequacy of what appears to be adequate. This is true not only with regard to its affirmative essence, but also in that it's in its own terms, it is not what it wants to be. Instances are the jigsaw puzzle aspects of musical classicism, the mechanical moments in box technique, the top-down construction in the paintings of the masters, which reigned for centuries under the name composition before, as Valéry noted, suddenly becoming a matter of indifference with the rise of Impressionism. Art's affirmative element and the affirmative element of the domination of nature are one in asserting that what was inflicted on nature was all for the good. By reenacting it in the realm of imagination, art makes it its own and becomes a song of triumph. In this, no less than in its silliness, art supplements the circus. In doing so, art finds itself in inextricable conflict with the idea of the redemption of suppressed nature. Even the most relaxed work is the result of a ruling tension that turns against the dominating spirit that is tamed in becoming the work. Prototypical of that is the concept of the classical. The experience of the model of all classicism, Greek sculpture, may retrospectively undermine confidence in it, as well as in later epochs. Classical art relinquished the distance to empirical existence that had been maintained by archaic images and carvings. According to tradi traditional aesthetics, classical sculpture aimed at the identity of the universal and the particular, the idea and the individual, because already it could no longer depend on the central appearance of the idea. If the idea was to appear in central form, it would have to integrate the empirically individuated world of appearance with its principle of form. This sets a limit to full individuation, however. Probably Greek classicism has not yet even experienced individuality. This occurred first in concordance with the direction of social development in Hellenic sculpture. The unity of the universal and the particular contrived by classicism was already beyond the reach of Attic art, let alone the art of later centuries. This is why classical sculptures stare with those empty eyes that alarm archaically instead of radiating that noble simplicity and quiet grandeur projected onto them by 18th century sentimentalism. Today, what is compelling in antiquity is fundamentally distinct from the correspondence that developed with European classicism in the era of the French Revolution and Napoleon, even in that of Baudelaire. Whoever does not, in the guise of the archaeologist or philologist, sign a covenant with antiquity, which certainly since the rise of humanism has ever and again shown itself not to be disdained, will not only find the normative claim of antiquity compelling, will not find the normative claim of antiquity compelling. Without protracted study, scarcely any of it speaks, and the quality of the works themselves is certainly not beyond question. What is overwhelming is the level of form. Scarcely anything vulgar or barbaric seems to have been passed down, not even from the imperial age, even though there the beginnings of mass production are unmistakable. The four mosaics of the villas in Ostia, which were presumably meant to be rented, are based on a single model. Ever since Attic classicism, the real barbarism of antiquity, the slavery, genocide, and contempt for human life, of few traces in art, just how chaste it kept itself, even in barbaric cultures, does not redound to its credit. The formal imminence of antique art is probably to be explained by the fact that the sensual world had not yet been debased by sexual taboos, which would come to encompass a sphere reaching far beyond its own immediate area. Baudelaire's classicist longing is precisely for that. In capitalism, what forces art against art into an alliance with the vulgar is not only a function of commercialism, which exploits a mutilated sexuality, but equally the dark side of Christian inwardness. The concrete transience of the classical, however, which Hegel and Marx did not experience, exposes the transience of its concepts and the norms deriving from it. The dilemma between superficial classicism and the demand that a work be coherent is apparently not one that arises from contrasting true classicism with plaster frauds. 
but this contrast is no more fruitful than that between modern and modernistic. But is it excluded in the name of a putative authenticity as its degenerate form is usually contained in the former as its ferment, the excision of which leaves it sterile and harmless. The concept of classicism stands in need of differentiation. It is worthless so long as in peaceful juxtaposition it lays out in state Goethe's Iphigenie and Schiller's Wallenstein. In popular usage, the concept of classicism means social authority, achieved for the most part through economic control mechanisms. It is fitting that Brecht was no stranger to this usage. Classicism of this sort should rather be held against artworks, yet it is so external to them that by way of all sorts of mediations, even authentic works may be bestowed with the accolade. The classical also refers to a standard of style without its being thereby possible to distinguish between the model, its legitimate appropriation, and fruitless imitation as conclusively as would suit that common sense that assumes it can knowingly play off the classical against classicism. Mozart would be inconceivable apart from the classicism of the late last years of the 18th century, with its stylistic imitation of the ancients, if the trace of these quoted norms of, in his music provides no basis for any convincing objection to the specific quality of the classical Mozart. Ultimately, to call a work classical refers to its imminent success the uncoerced yet ever fragile reconciliation of the one and the multisipitous. It has nothing to do with style and mentality and everything to do with accomplishment. Here, Valéry's comment applies that even a romantic artwork successfully brought off is by dint of its success classical. This concept of the classical is strung taught to the highest degree. It alone is worthy of critique. The critique of the classical, however, is more than the critique of those formal principles by which the classical has, for the most part, been manifest. The ideal of form, which is identified with classicism, is to be translated back into content. The purity of form is modeled on the purity of the subject, constituting itself, becoming conscious of itself, and divesting itself of the non-identical. It is a negative relation to the non-identical. It implies the distinction of form from content, a distinction concealed by the classical ideal. Form is constituted only through dissimilarity, only in that it is different from the non-identical. In form's own meaning, the dualism persists that form effaces. A counter-movement to myth, a counter-movement that classicism shares with the acme of Greek philosophy, was turned directly against the mimetic impulse. Mimesis was displaced by objectifying imitation. This counter-movement thereby easily succeeded in subsuming art to Greek enlightenment and making taboo that by which art takes the side of the suppressed against the domination of the imposed concept or of what slips through domination's narrow mesh. Though in classicism, the subject stands aesthetically upright, violence is done to it, to that eloquent particular that opposes the mute universal. In the much admired universality of the classical work, the pernicious universality of myth, the inescapability of the spell, is perpetuated as the norm of the process of formation. In classicism, where the autonomy of art originated, art renounces itself for the first time. It is no accident that since that moment, all classicisms have made ready alliance with science. To this day, the scientific mentality has harbored an antipathy, antipathy toward art that refuses voluntary subservience to categorical thought and the desiderata of clear-cut divisions. Whatever proceeds, as if there is no antinomy, is antinomic and degenerates into what bourgeois phraseology is always ready to dub formal perfection, about which nothing more need be said. It is not because of an irrational mentality that qualitatively modern movements frequently correspond, in Baudelaire's sense, with archaic pre-classical movements. They are, admittedly, no less exposed to the reactionary than is classicism by the delusion that the attitude to reality manifests in archaic works 
from which the emancipated subject wrested itself is to be reasserted regardless of what has historically transpired. The sympathy of the modern with the archaic is not repressively ideological only when this, that sympathy turns toward what classicism discarded along the course of its development and refuses to endorse the pernicious pressure from which classicism freed itself. But the one is rarely to be found without the other. In place of the identity of the universal and the particular, classical works provide its abstract logical radius, effectively a hollow form hopelessly awaiting specification. The fragility of the classical paradigm gives the lie to its paradigmatical status and thus to the classical ideal itself. It's going to take a short break. Contemporary aesthetics is dominated by the controversy over whether it is subjective or objective. These terms, however, are equivocal. Variously, the controversy may focus on the conclusion drawn from subjective reaction to artworks, in contrast to the intentio recta toward them, the intentio recta being considered pre-critical according to the current schema of epistemology. Or the two concepts could refer to the primacy of, object, of objective or subjective elements in the artworks themselves, in keeping, for instance, with the distinction made in the history of ideas between classical and romantic. Or lastly, the issue may be the objectivity of the aesthetic judgment of taste. These various meanings need to be distinguished from each other. With regard to the first, the direction of Hegel's aesthetics was objective, 
whereas with regard to the second, his aesthetics probably emphasized subjectivity more decisively than did all than did that of his predecessors, for whom the participation of the subject in the effect on an observer was limited even in the case of an ideal or transcendental observer. For Hegel, the subject-object dialectic transpires in the object itself. The relation of subject and object in the artwork, too, must not be forgotten, insofar as it is concerned with objects. This relation changes historically, yet persists even in non-representational works, for they take up an attitude to the object by placing it under a taboo. Still, the starting point of the critique of judgments was not simply inimical to an object of aesthetics. Its force was that, as throughout Kant's theories, it was not comfortably installed in any of the positions marked out by the system's strategies. Insofar as, according to his theory, aesthetics is constituted by the subjective judgment of taste, this judgment necessarily becomes not only a constituent of the objective work, but rather bears in itself an objective necessity, however little this necessity can be reduced to universal concepts. Kant envisioned a subjectively mediated but objectively but objective aesthetics. The Kantian concept of the judgment of taste by its subjectively directed query concerns the core of objective aesthetics, the question of quality, good and bad, true and false, in the artwork. The subjective query is itself more aesthetic than is the epistemological intentio obliqua because the objectivity of the artwork is mediated in a manner that is qualitatively different from the objectivity of knowledge, being mediated more specifically through the art, through the subject. It is virtually tautological to claim that the determination whether an artwork is an artwork depends on the judgment whether it is, that the mechanism of such judgments far more than any investigation of the power of judgment as a psychic ability is the theme of the work. Quote, the definition of taste on which I am basing this analysis is that it is the ability to judge the beautiful, but we have to analyze judgments of taste in order to discover what is required for calling an object beautiful, end quote. The canon of the work is the objective validity of the judgment of taste that while affording no guarantee, is nevertheless stringent. The situation of all nominalist art is thus prepared. Analogously with the critique of reason, Kant would like to ground aesthetic objectivity in the subject rather than to displace the former by the latter. Implicitly, he holds that the element that unifies the objective and the subjective is reason, a subjective ability at the same time that by virtue of its attributes of necessity and universality, it is the exemplar of all objectivity. For Kant, even the aesthetic is subordinated to the primacy of discursive logic. Quote, I have used the logical functions of judging to help me find the elements that judgment takes into consideration when it reflects, since even a judgment of taste still has reference to the understanding. I've examined the element of quality first because it an aesthetic judgment about the beautiful is concerned first with it, end quote. The strongest buttress of subjective aesthetics, the concept of aesthetic feeling, derives from objectivity, not the reverse. Aesthetic feeling says that something is thus, that something is beautiful. Kant would have attributed such aesthetic feeling as taste exclusively to one who is capable of discriminating in the object. Taste is not defined in Aristotelian fashion by sympathy and fear, the affects provoked in the viewer, the contamination of aesthetic feeling with unmediated, unmediated psychological emotions by the concept of arousal misinterprets the modification of real experience by artistic experience. It would otherwise be inexplicable why people expose themselves to aesthetic experience in the first place. Aesthetic feeling is not the feeling that is aroused. It is astonishment vis-a-vis -vis what is beheld rather than vis-a-vis -vis what it is about. It is a being overwhelmed by what is aconceptual and yet determinate, not the subjective affect released, that in the case of aesthetic experience may be called feeling. It goes to the heart of the matter, is the feeling for it and not a reflex of the observer. 
The observing subjectivity is to be strictly distinguished from the subjective element in the object, that is, from the object's expression as well as from its subjectively mediated form. The question, however, of what is and what is not an artwork cannot in any way be separated from the, fac from the faculty of judging, that is, from the question of quality, of good and bad. The idea of a bad artwork has something nonsensical about it. If it miscarries, if it fails to achieve its imminent constitution, it fails its own concept and sinks beneath the a priori of art. In art, judgments of relative merit appeals to fairness and toleration of the half-finished. All common sense excuses and even that of humanity are false. Their indulgence damages the artwork by implicitly liquidating its claim to truth. As long as the boundary that art sets up against reality has not been washed away, tolerance for bad works borrowed from reality is a violation of art. To be able to say with good reason why an artwork is beautiful, true, coherent, or legitimate does not mean reducing it to its universal concepts, even if this operation, which Kant both desired and contested, were possible. In every artwork, and not only in the a poria of the faculty of reflective judgment, the universal and the particular are densely intertwined. Kant touches on this when he defines the beautiful as, quote, that which pleases universally without requiring a concept, end quote. This universality, in spite of Kant's desperate effort, cannot be divorced from necessity. That something, quote, pleases universally, end quote, is equivalent to the judgment that it must please each and every person, for otherwise it would be merely an empirical statement. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to, I have to feed the cat. Just give me one second. Don't be surprised if you can hear him slobbering away in the background. Where was I? Okay. Kant touches on this when he defines the beautiful as, quote, that which pleases universally without requiring a concept, end quote. This universality, in spite of Kant's desperate effort, cannot be divorced from necessity. That something pleases universally is equivalent to the judgment that it must please each and every person or otherwise it would be merely an empirical statement. Yet universality and implicit necessity remain ineluctable concepts, and their unity, as Kant conceived it, in the act of pleasing is external to the work. The requirement of the subsumption of particulars to the unifying concept transgresses against the idea of conceptualization from within that, by means of the concept of finality, was to correct in both parts of the critique of judgment the classificatory method of theoretical natural scientific reason that emphatically rejects knowledge of the object from within. In this regard, Kant's aesthetics is a hybrid defenselessly exposed to Hegel's critique. His advance must be emancipated from absolute idealism. This is the task that today confronts aesthetics. The ambivalence of Kant's theory, however, is defined by his philosophy as a whole, in which the concept of purpose only extends the category into its regulative use, and thus, to this extent, also circumscribes it. He knows what it is that art shares with discursive knowledge, but not that whereby art diverges qualitatively from it. The distinction becomes the quasi-mathematical one between the finite and the infinite. No single rule by which the judgment of taste must subsume its objects, not even the totality of these rules, has anything to say about the dignity of an artwork. 
so long as the concept of necessity as constitutive of aesthetic judgment is not reflected into itself, it simply reproduces the deterministic mechanism of empirical reality, that mechanism that itself only returns in artworks in a shadowy and modified form. Yet the stipulation that beauty be universally pleasing presupposes a consent that is, though without admitting it, subordinate to social convention. If, however, these two elements are harnessed together in the intelligible realm, then Kant's doctrines forfeit its content. It is possible concretely to conceive of artworks that fulfill the Kantian judgment of taste and nevertheless miss the mark. Other works, indeed new art as a whole, contradict that judgment and are hardly universally pleasing, and yet they cannot thereby be objectively disqualified as art. Kant achieves his goal of the objectivity of aesthetics just as he does that of the objectivity of ethics by way of a universally conceptual formalization. This formalization is, however, contrary to the aesthetic phenomena as what is constitutively particular. What each artwork would need to be according to its pure concept is essential to none. Formalization, an act of subjective reason, forces art back into precisely that merely subjective sphere, ultimately that of contingency, from which Kant wanted to wrest it and which art itself resists. As contrary poles, subjective and objective aesthetics are equally exposed to the critique of a dialectical aesthetics, the former because it is either abstractly transcendental or arbitrary in its dependence on individual taste, the latter because it overlooks the objective mediatedness of art by the subject. In the artwork, the subject is neither the observer nor the creator nor absolute spirit, but rather spirit bound up with, performed and mediated by the object. That's a pretty sick line to end on, but uh, I'll see you later today.